health and happiness. We all want health. We all want to be happy. It could be said that health and happiness begin in the mind, into the heart, and then come out as habits, actions. Habits of health, habits of happiness. Well, that sounds easy, right? Well, not quite. We'll, what we'll see in the study of Colossians is that there's something that precedes and exceeds our, our use of sheer willpower. Namely, it is that we must have the reconciling of God through Jesus Christ. Unless we can experience reconciliation through Christ, there is no hope of health or happiness, or as I call it here, of wholeness or fullness or being filled with God. But through Christ, as believers, through Christ, we have the power of the Holy Spirit who impresses himself on our mind, upon our will, in our heart, so that our actions, our habits can be habits of health and happiness. Now, in today's message, what we're going to learn is we're going to learn that healthy people are thankful people. Healthy people are thankful people. If you want to experience more peace, a greater sense of the presence of God in, in your life and in this world, if you want to experience better relationships, how many here want to experience better relationships? Let me see your hand. All right, hands up. All right, let's see who's not raising their hand. Okay, all right. Oh, they're, you're pointing at each other. Okay. We, we want to experience better relationships all around, right? How do you do that? Well, let me, let me challenge you today to, to, to practice gratitude, thanksgiving. I, I guarantee you on God's word that that will help. That will help. That will bring some health and some happiness to your relationships. When I read this short letter of Paul to the Colossians, I'm amazed at how upbeat he is because his situation, his circumstances do not lend themselves to either health or happiness, certainly not to Thanksgiving. You see, uh, in his bad situation, we find that he is writing this letter, these letters of Colossians and Philemon from prison. And we'll look at that in just a moment. Now let me just introduce this, this series of, of sermons that we're going to look at called Filled, Finding Wholeness in Christ, a study in the books of Colossians and Philemon. Throughout this series, we're going to focus on a key word, and I, I guarantee you, it probably won't take you long as you read through Colossians to find what that key word is. Uh, it appears in the first chapter, it appears in the second chapter, it appears everywhere throughout the book of Colossians, and it is this word filled or full or fullness. We'll come across it several times. And what this, this means, this wholeness in Christ, what it means is that happiness, health and happiness only come through Jesus Christ. That's the big idea of Colossians. If you want to be healthy, if you want to be happy, the only way to be so is to find Jesus Christ and his reconciliation. Now, only with this in mind will the, this big idea of finding health and happiness be anything more than a mo motivational speech. Because you can go to motivational seminars, you can, go to all, you can read you know, self-help books, you can, you can listen to whoever the latest you know, trendy guy is who, who tells you how to be healthy and happy, and they will exclude Christ altogether. Can I tell you something? You cannot be healthy and happy at all. You cannot find wholeness. You cannot be fulfilled in life without Jesus Christ. God didn't made the world that way. He made the world so that the only way to be healthy and happy is to have Jesus Christ. You understand, without Jesus Christ, you might think that you're healthy, or someone may even tell you that you look healthy. Someone may even tell you you look happy. But you can't be. That's not how God created the world. There is no happiness apart from Jesus Christ. And Paul recognizes that, and he's going to tell us that. Today, what we're going to learn in this passage, the first eight verses of Colossians, is this, that healthy and happy people are thankful people. Thankful people. So not only does health and happiness come only in Jesus Christ, and, but in this passage, 
he's going to take on this theme, which in, in a way is the theme of the whole book of Colossians, but we're going to see different uh, statements that Paul makes about being whole. Uh, today, in the first eight verses, it is thankful. Ha healthy and happy people are thankful people. Now let's talk a little bit about the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians was written from the city of Ephesus. Now there are people who will say, well, no, he was probably, Paul was probably imprisoned in Rome or maybe, maybe Caesarea. That is possible, but the evidence looks like he was probably in Ephesus. I plan to make a video to talk a little bit more about that so you can do some deeper study. And it was probably written in about the year 55. The year 55, so about 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the major city of Ephesus. Only Rome, only Alexandria are larger cities in the Roman world than Ephesus. Major city. And Paul has once again um, repeatedly stirred up trouble in the city of Ephesus. You can read about it in, in Acts chapter 19, one of my favorite passages in, Acts, in, in the book of Acts. But in Acts 19, Paul's in Ephesus, and he's stirring up trouble. There's such a, a, a spirit of conversion taking that and just gripping that city that uh, by the end of that passage, uh, the silversmiths and the idol makers and the, the magicians, and the, the craftsmen of the temple of Artemis. They're, they're all gathering together and they're having a city meeting to determine how they can get rid of Paul because their prosperity is suffering. The idol-making business, the sin business, is experiencing a tremendous depression because there's a revival happening through the preaching of the gospel. Now imagine that in our world. That... God's people would be so contagious, so full of the health and the happiness of the Holy Spirit that the economy of our culture and community is rapidly changed, amazingly changed. That the, the sinful business, that, that the, the, the industries that, that sell sin would suddenly be wringing their hands of, what are we going to do? We better start cooperating together or else we're all going to be sunk. Right? Wow. Wow. What, a, what an amazing time to live. But you know what? There are consequences to that. And Paul experienced those because he was in prison. Paul and his companions, he lists them. We'll see them here throughout this study. He lists several of them. They're in chains. They're bound in a prison, which is not an unfamiliar circumstance for Paul. He tells us, 1 Corinthians 11, sorry, 2 Corinthians 11, he tells us that he, he's been stoned, not just once, but multiple times. He's been put in prison. He has been uh, you know, held without food. He has been beaten multiple times. I mean, this guy's gone through it, all right? So we, we kind of exalt, you know, the Apostle Paul, like, wow, man, like he was, he was always, always had a smile on his face, was always singing, because didn't he sing in, in uh, the Philippian prison, right, in Acts? He was singing with, with Silas in the, in the Philippian prison. So, so he was always just feeling good and healthy and happy, right? Wrong. No. No. He bore the marks of standing up for Jesus. And yet on this, in this letter of Colossians, it's so upbeat. When we read through the letter of Colossians, keep this in mind. Here's a man who, uh, we don't know, he doesn't tell us all that has happened to him in, Philippian, in, in, in this Ephesian jail. But we do know that he, had, that he had been stoned in the area. He had probably been beaten. And who knows, and maybe on this occasion, he had fresh wounds, blood still, still falling from his back from having been beaten. And undoubtedly, they didn't treat people well in prison, all right? You understand that? That's the circumstance, and yet how upbeat this letter is, and we're going to find out why. He wrote four letters from this Ephesian jail. He wrote the letters of Philippians. He wrote the letter of Colossians that we're looking at. He wrote a letter that is titled to the Ephesians, um, although that was a circular letter. It was a letter that would be passed from town to town, so it wasn't just to the Ephesians. And then he wrote a personal letter to the man named Philemon. 
Now the reason we're studying Colossians and Philemon together, two of those four letters that he wrote, is because this letter to the Colossians obviously is written to the new church in Colossae. But Philemon is a very wealthy man in that church who needs, needs some instruction. And so Paul writes to the church, and then he writes a personal letter to this one man who's within this church. We'll study that together. Paul is in prison, and if I were in prison, I would want to be with friends. Uh, Paul happened to be. Now, it doesn't mean he shared a jail cell, but the prisons, I've been in some of them over the Middle East. They're, they're not very big. Uh, they're big stone walls, echo. You, you can talk, and you can hear. You can communicate. You could sing, uh, undoubtedly. Paul was in prison with Timothy, Aristarchus, with John Mark, with Demas, with Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke and the author of Acts, and with Epaphras when he was writing this. And we know that because he tells us in various places throughout the letter. For instance, here in chapter 4, he says in Colossians, he says to the Colossians, please, please pray for us, he and his companions who are in jail, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am right now in prison. Now, he writes a lot of things in this short letter, and we'll go across, we'll come across several ideas, but the central idea is this idea of being filled, being filled, finding wholeness in Christ. And what he's trying to urge these young Colossian Christians is, is don't be drawn astray by other false gods or other things that promise health and happiness, but always let you down. Now, every single one of us have a testimony, all right? And our testimony, in one way or another, basically, basically follows the same narrative, right? It follows the narrative of, I tried this, 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 and this to be healthy and happy and didn't find it, right? Until we were reconciled with Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing. Here's, here's where I, one of the places I want to challenge us. Does our faith in Jesus Christ convince anyone else that Jesus Christ is the only source of health and happiness. Not too many amens, not poor part, but maybe Lord help us, right? Paul's letter to the Colossians, it's so upbeat. Yes, he has some warnings. He has some admonitions. He has some commands for this young church, but it's, it's so, he's just so positive and, and, and encouraging and so certain that if a person who is a Christian will really understand and, and live out reconciliation with Christ, the Christian life, that, that can't help but make other people turn and look and say, wow, that person, those Christians, that church, they're healthy and they're happy. Look at how they love each other. I want to be a part of that. Do people look at us and say, wow, man, that church, they love each other. They take care of each other. Right? That's what Christ wants to be seen, how he wants to be seen through his church and through his people. God help us. Let me give you a few examples. Um, he says, in verse 9, he uses this word being filled with the knowledge of his will. In verse 10, that we may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. In verse 24, he says that he is filling up and his suffering was lacking in Christ's affliction. We're going to look at that. That's a puzzling statement. In verse 19 of chapter 1, in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In verse 20, through, through Christ, uh, God is pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on on earth or in heaven, fullness idea. Uh, he says in verse 28 of chapter 1, Him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone. He used the word mature, but that's the same idea, whole, complete in Christ. And then here's the verse, chapter 2, verse 10, which I think is the central verse of the whole letter. It says to Christians, you, Christians, have been filled in Him who is the head of all rule and authority. Notice how he appeals here 
to the authority, the headship, the power of Jesus Christ. You have been filled, Christians, believers, with the one who has all power in all earth for all time. Amen. Praise be to God. Amen? Amen. We're filled with Christ. Now live like it, Paul says. Don't shortchange yourself by missing out on the fullness of Christ and what he has for you, young believers. Now, Epaphras, I mentioned him. You heard that name? Epaphras. He's in prison with Paul and Ephesians. Epaphras was probably converted under Paul's ministry in Ephesus. Paul spent about three years in Ephesus preaching that, that, that city, large city, was just radically changed. Not without spiritual warfare, but man, radical change. Epaphras was saved. He went back about 120 miles inland to this little village of Colossae. And he started a church. He planted a church. And Epaphras, as Paul will, will mention him in this passage, Epaphras started that church, found out again that Paul was going to be in Ephesus and travels 120 miles to go visit his spiritual father. And so he does, and in the meantime, gets himself thrown in prison with Paul. So here they are together. Epaphras is in prison. Epaphras is telling Paul all about this young church. And so Paul says, I'm going to write. I've never been to Colossae, never met the people, don't know who they are. But I'm going to write a letter to them. Now, there's another man who's mentioned uh, by Paul whose name was Onesimus. We'll study him as well, a young man who was from Colossae as well. And, and Paul's going to send this letter uh, uh, several letters uh, with some messengers back to this young church and we'll see what it is that Paul says the idea here is the fullness of Christ so let's look at Colossians chapter 1 verses 1 through 8 he says Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus the will of God and Timothy our brother to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae grace to you and peace from God our father we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. Man, he's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Has made known to us your love in the Spirit. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This spring, uh, my wife and uh, I think some of the kids got... Uh, a few dozen plants, and you know, you put them in those little, little small planters, and you line them all up in your tray. You set them out when it's sunny, and you pull them in when it's snow, and you, you, you put them out when they need some rain, or you, you carefully guard them, right? Well, they've sprouted up, and I don't know, they're they're three, four inches maybe uh, out of of that soil that they're in, and we're we're trying to care for them, and we're trying to make sure that we get something. I don't know what it is, flowers or something that that we'll get hopefully someday. Well, that's what Paul's doing. He, there's this young church plant, 120 miles to the east. He's never been there. But it's a church plant. He's, he's learned about it, and, and he wants to help care for that. He takes no credit in this, in this letter for really having anything to do with the Colossians, but he wants to help care, and so he writes these letters. Now, it must have been quite a surprise for the Colossians to receive a letter from the Apostle Paul. I mean, the Apostle Paul by this time is, is well known. For several years now, Paul's been traveling. His, he, he was already known as, a, as the great uh, persecutor of the church, but now he's the great preacher of the church. He's well known, and here is a letter by his hand as he concludes the letter. You'll see that he, he says, this is written with my own hand. Wow, what a, what a privilege it must have been to receive that letter. Now, I imagine that some of us have letters that we've kept from days bygone. This past week, maybe you got one. I got a letter from the president. From the president. Anyone else get a letter from the president of the United States? All right, you got one? All right, four of us. All right, so we're exclusive. We're in the exclusive club of having a letter from the president of the United States this week that told us something about 
giving money away. I don't remember what I didn't really pay too much attention to it. But something about you should have received this much stimulus and, and he put his name on the end, right? Well, well he, I, I doubt he really signed that. Do you think he signed your letter, Seth? No, I don't, I don't think he actually signed my letter with his own hand. This is signed with Paul's own hand, all right? I, in fact, I think I threw that letter away. Now, if it had been with, if, if President Joe Biden, I don't care if you like him or not, if he had signed that with his own ink, with his own pen, I probably would keep that letter, all right? I'd probably hold on to that. Uh, I know some people would buy that uh, from it. It'd be, have some value. <laughs> I don't know. But, but this, this was worthless. It, it was worthless, right? It wasn't worth much. But th man, this letter to receive someone from, from, from the Apostle Paul, that's, that's a big deal. Paul, an apostle, he says, as he begins, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, ancient letters are a little bit different from modern day letters. Uh, where do you put your name when you write a letter today? You, uh, do anyone write letters anymore? All right. Or email, you send an email and you sign it in the bottom, right? All right, so I have my signature, you know, at the bottom of, of a letter, you sign it, right? Well, in ancient world, you put your name at the beginning. This is, this is me writing, you know, this is Paul, the apostle, who's writing to you. You put it at the end, so that's why we have this in the beginning. Now, and he identifies himself as an apostle, which is an exclusive group. To be an apostle means that you are an eyewitness, a personal eyewitness of Jesus, of his ministry. Now, you say, well, wait, Sam, Paul wasn't one of the 12 disciples. How did, how did he become an apostle? Well, you can read in Galatians 1, for instance. You can read in Acts. You can read how Jesus uh, appeared to Paul. Obviously, first on the road to Damascus, but then later uh, in the wilderness, Jesus appeared to Paul and taught personally Paul and talked to him as he had talked to his 12 disciples previously. And so Paul was an apostle, one of, one of several apostles in, to whom uh, Jesus had ministered and revealed uh, special revelation to them. And they wrote this down, and we have that in Scripture. We have their record, their written record. Thanks be to God. He says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And he adds Timothy because Timothy is his, is, um, his son in the faith. Timothy is one of several that Paul mentions as his son in the faith. And, and Timothy is also there in prison. And Timothy is giving input on this letter. Uh, maybe Timothy is the one writing it and then Paul's the one signing it. That was not unusual in this day. But Timothy is there and he is, he is sharing and so that's why in verse 3 you have the pronoun we that follows. And what we see in verse, in verse 2, he says, we're writing this to the saints and the faithful brothers in Christ in Colossae. Now, this is not referring to two groups of people. Now, the way we break things up in our, in, in our way of thinking, thanks to you know, the Roman Catholic Church that does this, we have the saints. Now, who are the saints? The saints are old and super holy. Right? That's pretty much the two qualifications. And probably dead. Okay? Uh, that, that's pretty much that's the qualification. In the Roman Catholic Church, you have to be dead to be a saint. All right? Uh, but we've had people in our church, we think back to, uh, to, to Sister Barnes, right? How many, how many of you knew Sister Barnes, Bessie Barnes? All right, a few of you. Not many of you are around anymore that, that, that remembered her. But I remember her. I remember Sister Wagner, uh, Glass Wagner sitting over here. I, just a bunch of, bunch of you know, wonderful people who I would call saints, right? Why? Because I looked up to their faith. I, they, they, they testified. Hey, you want to be remembered by people? Testify. Yeah. Amen? You want people years later after you're dead and gone to say, oh man, bless, you know, bless that, that, that man or that woman, that saint. They're probably going to remember you because you testified. True. All right. Um, very little response going on that one, but that's okay. <laughs> Testify. Make your faith be known genuinely, all right? Because people know how you live out there too, all right? So testify, genuine testimony. Saints. No, no. Saints, faithful brothers. It's all one group, all right? So if you are a believer and these Christians, they hadn't been Christians long enough to qualify as being old and super holy, all right? These are young and learning. These are plants that are barely broken through the ground, all right? They're just little. They've hardly, they've hardly borne any fruit yet, all right? They've hardly flowered. 
And he says, man, you're saints, you're holy ones, you're, you're brothers, you're faithful brothers. But he makes two points here. Um, one is the word saints was first used over in, only one time in the Old Testament. One time in the Old Testament it was used, and it's in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, you can read through there, and you will find that it is the saints who inherit the kingdom of God. That's the promise that's made in Daniel's vision that, that, that God gives to him. And he tells us in Daniel chapter 7, he says in verse 18, But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and forever and ever. Three times. Forever and forever and forever. Saints. That's Old Testament. The only time the word holy ones or saints appears in the Old Testament. So in the New Testament, Paul picks up on that and says, Hey, that's you. Yes, you. You've been saved for one day. You're included. You're a saint and you're a faithful brother. Praise God. So if you don't think you qualify as old and super holy or dead, you, but you do have faith in Jesus Christ, you are a saint. You're a saint. All right? So saint, Saint Seth. Hey, that has a ring to it, doesn't it? Saint Seth. That's a ring to it. Saint David Gilbert. He was patient with us on the trail yesterday. He is a saint. He exemplified pa the patience of Christ. Uh, you're, you're saints and your fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. He uses this uh, familial language in order to describe our fellowship, our fellowship with God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Being a part of the kingdom affair of God is a family affair. Really, it's saints and siblings. That's who we are. Saints and siblings. Now, in this family, in this family of God, they say you can't, you can't, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose family, right? Uh, well, th that really also applies to the church. Yeah, yeah. We, there are a lot of cho church choices in our day. You can kind of choose where you go to church. But man, if you are a believer in Christ, the whole church is your family. Your brothers, we are brothers and sisters. Notice here, he says, saints and faithful in Christ. And he uses the word, in English, we have the word in Christ. And then we, heard, we have the word at Colossae. It's the same word in Greek. In Christ, in Colossae. And so he's saying, you are citizens of a heavenly family, but you're also in a local church. In other words, your our commitment to Christ exemplifies itself or manifests itself through our commitment in a local body. Amen? That was kind of weak. Thank you, Reed. All right. Amen. You, we manifest our commitment to Christ through our commitment to our brothers and sisters with whom we worship. Say amen. 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 Absolutely. So the local church is not something you can just take out of God's plan for salvation. God wants us to experience fullness in Christ through the people that he has placed in our life that we call the church our particular local, local congregation. Now, there's a whole theology. If you want to take a whole theology of the church, you can take my class. I, I teach for 15 weeks on the doctrine of the church. You, you're welcome to sign up for that and take it. Man, there's a lot. There's a lot there to consider. But he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father. That's another way of saying health and, and happiness. It's, it's their way of greeting. Health, be healthy. Grace to you. God be with you. Give you peace. Remember, that's, that's wholeness. Health. May you be, be filled with health and happiness from God our Father. He concludes the letter that way as well. And then we come to what I just call the super sentence. Uh, because in the original language in Greek, in the Greek New Testament, Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8 is one sentence. Now, thankfully, the translation translators break it up into like two or three, all right? But it is a 102 word long sentence in Greek, and Paul is notorious for those kind of things. I mean, talking, man, if my dissertation committee, had, if I had written that, they would put sentence fragment there you go, right there, or run on sentence, you know, it's like, it just goes on and on and on and on, all right? But uh, the Holy Spirit was the editor here, and he allowed it, so it passed... And, and so we accept it as it is. Verses uh, 3 through 8. 
He says that he's thankful. He, he begins with this. He says, we, again, speaking, Timothy, Paul, others who are traveling with him, we are always thankful to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. When we pray for you. This is the main thought of this passage of 1 through 8. It's thankfulness. Remember, remember, healthy people are thankful people. You want to be full? Be thankful. Be grateful. Practice thanksgiving. Paul and Timothy, Epaphras, Luke, John Mark, all those who are here in prison, they're not in prison having a prison pity party. They're praying. They're saying, thank you, Lord, that while we suffer, we're suffering because the gospel is flourishing out there somewhere. Thank you, Jesus. If we, like these incarcerated Christians, could stretch our care capacity for others, we might learn how to be thankful more regularly. Here's the problem, all right? Here's the challenge. Uh, I, let me just say, th this is my challenge, all right? My challenge with gratitude is this. It's really simple. My challenge with gratitude is that I am thankful when I have some success. Right? I am thankful when God has answered my prayer, has given me success, has given me some, some advantage or some blessing or some, something good. Lord, thank you. I'm so thankful. I'll even tell you about it. I'll tell other people, man, you know what God did for me? But here's the problem. You know why I, you know why I have not consistently practiced gratitude? It's because I'm so self-centered in how I, for what I'm thankful Paul is teaching us here that his gratitude has, is, I mean, he's, he is, he's willing to suffer for the gospel and be in prison, clearly. He's willing to do that. His gratitude is not that he's bound or that he's been beaten and bloodied. His gratitude is for somebody else's success. Now, my guess is that you're not much different than I am on this. Right is that you find it easy to be grateful when something is just really, really good happening in your life. But what about when it's not happening in your life? But it is happening in somebody else's life. Fellow brother or fellow sister. Can you, can you, let me point it back to me. Can I find it within my heart to be grateful then? Sincerely? Thank you, God. Thank you for, for blessing him or blessing her. Thank you for that she's having a great day or he's having a great day or he's having success in, in his place of business or this or that or having good health. Thank you. I don't feel so well, but thank you that they are. How about it? That's what Paul was doing. Not just Paul, but Timothy and Luke and John Mark and Epaphras and, and Aristarchus and, and his other brothers who were in prison with them. They were thanking God and can do always because their gratitude is not limited to what God is doing for them. God help us stretch our care capacity so that we can rejoice in another believer's successes. Maintain a gratitude of spirit. And he says, we've been doing this. Every time we pray for you, we thank God for you ever since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and that love that you have for all the saints. Oh, wow, this is a whole sermon itself. Here we see that the Colossians, they, they have faith in Christ. That, that's love for God. And then they have love for their brothers. That's love of God and love of neighbor. You see that? Two great commands. Paul comments that the Colossians love all the saints. Now, now we're going to have a show of hands, all right? So everybody wake up, all right? We're going to have a show of hands, and I'm going to ask you a question, and let's see if you answer it correctly. Um, I mean, I don't know. You should know. Uh, but I want to see here if, if you have gotten this idea of what a saint is, okay? So remember, you remember what a saint is? You remember what a saint is not? Any of the proper qualifications are... If, you, if you're a saint, just, this is going to be so hard for some of you. If you're a saint, all right, are you a saint? Yes. Are you a saint? Amen? Yes. All right. I mean, we don't go around telling people, man, no, read, please call me Saint David, would you? I, I know, but when I said Saint Seth, man, his face just glowed. It was just like, oh, he, just kidding, just kidding. No, I mean, that's weird, right? It, it's weird to, we don't call people Live people, saints, right? 
so he says, you love all the, in other words, you love each other, all of your fellow believers, no matter how young they are in the faith or how old they are, you love each other. Wow, we've been thanking God. Maybe, maybe the circumstance in the first century was not so much different from what it is today. And Paul's thinking, thank God for a church that loves each other. Maybe that's what he's thinking here. Man, I'm so excited to hear that Epaphras has established a church. The churches I've established, they're, they're having some trouble. That church in Corinth, oh my goodness. Wow, trouble there, right? Galatians, man, they're being led astray all over the place. But man, this is a young church that loves each other. Don't let it stop. Amen. Don't let it stop. You love each other. Now, notice here, this is, this is not just, you know, extensive, like all. You love everybody, but it's really intensive. That is, you love, you, you love the people with whom you share Christ with, the, your church. He's talking about their, their local church here. He's essentially talking about the Christian love that exists within the church. Paul's happy that the Colossians have faith in Christ and that they are loving each other and so doing Showing their faith in Christ, what it really looks like. Why? Now, why, why did he goes on? Why is it, what is it that's motivating their love? What is moving them to be so expressive in their love for one another? It's the next, next verse. He says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. In other words, they have, a, these are people who have a clear vision of where they're going. They're going somewhere, right? I mean, they are, they are going and they're going by God's grace together. Amen? They're going together. Man, the way you see some Christians treat each other, man, how in the world are they going to get along for all eternity? Man, it's going to be hell, not heaven. God help us. Right? Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Now, I guarantee you right now, I guarantee you there's so, I, there are people that come to my mind, I'm embarrassed to say that, but there are people who come to my mind who I think, wow, I hope their mansion's not right, right next to mine. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. Come on. You're, you're, be honest with yourself. You, you've thought that too, right? I've heard some of you say that. <laughs> right? Man, I, I hope they're across on a different planet, you know? God has prepared a place for you, and that's somewhere out there. <sighs> yeah. That's not the attitude. That's not the attitude of the Colossians. Their attitude is, man, we get to spend eternity with each other. We get to spend eternity with each other. And the beautiful thing about that is that there, we, we do it with, with the hope that Christ is reconciling all things to himself. There will be nothing to cause division or distaste in, in us for someone else. It's, it's gonna be, we're going to be authentic and enlightened by Christ himself. All right, amazing. That's why, that's why this, is, this is so profound. Their love for each other is grounded in their faith in Christ and the hope that is laid up for them in heaven. Now, the idea here that the hope that is laid up, the idea here is that the Colossians' love springs up out of hope. And hope here is not just an abstract idea, but it's Jesus Christ. That is what Jesus has accomplished. Remember, their faith is in Christ. And they love all of the saints. But hope here is hope in what Jesus Christ has done, his accomplishment, his resurrection. So what is stored up for us in heaven, that is the control center, the control room, if I may call it that, of the universe. That's how the Old Testament kind of pictures it. The control room of the universe, our hope is stored up. That is, Christ has been deposited. And out of, that, out of his resurrection, out of his victory, springs out hope for us. And for that reason, we can love one another. All right? So, now, perhaps you're like me. You know, so, I will... I will, you know, sit down at my computer and I will, uh, you know, try to upload or download something and I'll watch that. And usually it's a little circle or sometimes it's a line. You see that, you see that little, that little dark line just start gradually making around that circle, right? And it shows it's load, loading, you know, 25% and 50% and it keeps going. You, you, ever, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you see that? 
And I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm just weird. I know that. But I, you know, I sit there and I think, man, I wonder what life's going to be when that's finished. <laughs> what's it going to be like to you know, get, this, get this completely downloaded or to, to get this finished? You know, I'm not the kind of person that likes to wait on things. I'm, I, I struggle with patience. I, I do. I struggle. And, and I don't want to just sit there and watch a circle fill out, right? And so I, 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 it does. It's amazing. Like, I wonder what life's going to be like in a few minutes when that's finished. <laughs> It's going to be amazing. It's going to be incredible when it's just finished. Like, just get there, right? And that's, the, that's kind of the sense with there. Like, they're hoping. Like, they're, they're already living in anticipation. Like, man, what's it going to be like when, when the resurrection's complete? It's already started. That's the thing. It's already, the resurrection has begun. Amen? Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. The resurrection has begun. It's only started. It hasn't, hasn't taken a step back. It's stepping forward. It's already stepping forward. The final download for eternal life is, is it's coming. It's happening, but it's not fully realized yet, it, but it's happening. And they live in light of that hope. Paul continues, he says, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you. Now here, this, uh, let's look at this, the word of truth, the gospel, he, and he's very intentional. This is the word, uh, singular here, the word of truth. This is the, the, this is the truth that matters most, the central truth. Of all facts and reality, it's this. Now, we are, uh, what would the, the word be? Connoisseurs of just useless information. I mean, we just, we are, I mean, you can go to the internet and you can find all kinds of things worth not knowing, not worth knowing, right? Uh, you can just find useless, we're inundated with useless information. I mean, just inundated. It's just we, we're, we you know, we see something and we take it in and man, boom, something else gets our attention and we move on to that. It's just one thing after another. We're just inundated by, by just really useful, or useless information. And here's the, here's the thing that happens then is, is, and we find this out as teachers, right? As teachers, those of us who, who have taught, you know, these generations, we find out, and, and this is true also, of, you know, in, in seminary, right? So I teach, I teach graduate students. So these are, you know, 25, 35, 40, 50 year old students, even 60 year olds. And what I'm finding is when they go do research, they're having a, they have a hard time filtering. How do you know what's useful and what's not? What is right and what's not? You have to fact check all your fact checking. Yeah. Yeah, it's like fact check what the pastor said and then fact check the fact checker to make sure it's right, right? And then how do you know? You're just kind of lost, right? How do you know? I had, I had information passed to me this week that was false and could have really, really made for some awkward inf <laughs> relationship, could have really, really caused some trouble. And, and thankfully I checked, I checked and to verify. And it took a while, it took days to verify. One of the skills that uh, parents have to, uh, and teachers, have to really develop is the skill of reading between the lines, right? You get information. So here's how, here's how it works as a parent. So I have a son who comes to me and says, says, Dad, he hit me, or something to that effect. I mean, it could be pinch, kick, throw something. It could be all sorts of things, right? Dad, he hit me. Now, in that moment, I have to read between the lines, right? So I have four sons. Oh, how they love each other. <laughs> four sons. And you have to read between the lines, okay? A, it could be, Dad, I want you to get him in trouble. Right. All right? I want you to do something to him that I can't. All right? <laughs> that could be, that's A. B, could be, um, you know, it could be something like, I'm telling you this so that when he comes and tells you that I pinched him, you'll understand, <laughs> right? Could be that. Or C, it could be all the above, right? Which is most likely. Read between the lines. Now, in several of these verses, Paul is just, in this big, long, 102-word sentence, Paul is just making this point. All right, let's just cut this down to, five, to, to six words, right? He is writing to the Colossians say, saying, Thank God you guys get it. All right, that's basically it. 102 words, reduce it down to six. Thank God you guys get it. That's what Paul's saying. 
verses 3 through 8. You write that in your Bible. I think you can fit that in the margin of your Bible, surely. Thank God you guys get it. You get it. You've heard the word of truth, the gospel. You get the whole point. You understand the hope that comes from it, the love that it motivates. You get it. And, and here's, let me say this before we move on. The gospel, the word of truth, it is the target. It is, this world is, is filled with information, but unless we understand the whole point, it's all useless. And he's saying, you understand the word of truth, the gospel. You understand that everything has to be run through this grid of the gospel, of faith, hope, and love. And so he says, in fact, this is happening all over the world, all over the, the world. The gospel is bearing fruit. It's increasing. And as it has also among you since the day you heard of it and understand the grace of God and truth. Let's move on. Then he, finally, he concludes this uh, passage. He's saying, you've learned it. He says, man, I'm so proud to be your spiritual grandfather? No. He takes no credit whatsoever. His thanks, thanksgiving is genuine and genuinely placed in what Epaphras, how God has used Epaphras, somebody else. He says, just as you've learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, wow, he's so faithful. He's been a faithful minister on, of Christ on your behalf. On your behalf. And here we are sitting in prison and he tells us He's made known to us your love in the Holy Spirit. Wow, what a beautiful, what a beautiful uh, commendation of his brother Epaphras. Now, let me give you these three words, conclusion. What's this mean for us? What's Paul's letter? Man, it's you know, 55 AD. That's, that's been a long time ago, nearly 2,000 years ago. Does it have any significance for us? I think it does. Number one. I've already said a healthy person is a thankful person, but may God stretch our capacity for gratitude by rejoicing with others, with others. Make that part of our regular speech and attitude and spirit. Paul's in jail. He has a lot to grumble about, but he is genuinely happy because someone else has, has had success in the gospel. I'm reminded last week of the, in our evening service, our scripture we read from 1 Corinthians 12, 26, which says, when one member suffers, all the members suffer together. But if one is honored, we all rejoice, right? God, stretch my care capacity so that I'm not, I'm not thankful only when your goodness is shown to me. But let me rejoice and be thankful for, what's God, for what God is doing for you for others. That's number one. The other would be uh, the grid of the gospel. Again, we live in an information age. It's difficult to filter. What do we need? We need a grid. We need a grid of the gospel. That is, there are three key words here that appear in this passage. Paul uses them in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, faith, hope, love. He says, I've heard of your faith in Christ and your love for all the saints because of your hope. Faith, hope, love. Run that through the grid. Is what is coming at you, is it consistent with faith in Christ? If not, filter it out. Is it consistent with faith in Christ? Does it deepen your hope in the resurrection? All right, take it in if it does. Does it compel me to love my neighbor? Man, take it in if it does. It's out if it doesn't. Use the grid of the gospel in your intake. And then third, truth and love truth and love the Christian life is a fruitful life as he mentions in verses uh, 6 and uh, in verse 6 where the, the gospel is it's bearing fruit it's increasing it's a fruitful life particularly a Christian life grounded in truth and the increasing in love is a fruitful life so let me say this if you are unconcerned we need to hear this today. If you are unconcerned about truth, your care for Christ and others will diminish until you are completely sterile and perhaps dead altogether in your faith. Christians care about truth. Amen. And sometimes truth is hard, right? But we care about truth. Health and happiness... Do not come without truth. Truth and love. One cannot continue to fellowship with Christ without 
continuing in fellowship with his body. Truth, we need truth that moves us to love one another as Christ has loved us. Would you stand with me this morning? Oh God of peace and of grace, of truth and of love, we ask you today that you would take this, your word, from the hand of Paul through the inspiration of the Spirit, and would you etch it deeply within our own heart. I pray that you would teach us to suffer with our brothers and sisters when they suffer, and to rejoice when our brothers and sister, sisters are honored and rejoice. I pray you would give us your spirit of truth and love, and that the gospel would, would prosper in us because of our gratitude, sincere gratitude. Oh God, increase our care capacity, we ask. We pray that people would look on to your church and they would see the glory of God, the glory of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We pray this. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.